Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who was right the first time when he was wrong the last time. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Well, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on this blood orange blonde brew called Hunter's Harvest from Second Crossing Brew Company. If you like a beer that is bitter and sweet with some good blood orange and hints of orange peel, this is for you. ABV 4.7% and a beautiful color to this beer as well. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And let's give some thanks and praise to our good friends for helping us out with this week's show. A big we like your jib to Allison in Liverpool, England. And last but certainly not least, we have Julie DeVecchio in Rochester, Minnesota. Everybody we just mentioned helped us out, helped out the garage this week. If you want to help out the garage, go to the website and click on the pint glass or visit our merch page and pick you up some garage swag. Yeah, B W W R U N beer run. If you're not on the mailing list, then you don't know the special 25% off code. And if you're not following us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you don't know the code either. So if you want to save some money on some TCG swag, make sure you follow us on social media and make sure you sign up on our mailing list. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. It's been over 30 years since 18-year-old Denise Flum disappeared from Connorsville, Indiana in 1986. She went out to retrieve her purse that she lost the night before at a party, and she never came home. Her vehicle was found the following day, and we, as we pointed out in episode one, are missing a lot of important statements. One in particular is the property owner of where the party was the night before. I'm curious as to why we've never heard, and my guess is maybe the individual or individuals was never questioned, but I'm curious as to why we've never heard one simple thing in this case. Ask that person who threw the party or the persons that threw the party, did you see Denise on the day that she went missing? She left her home to retrieve her purse. What we don't know is, After they find her car the following day, four miles away from where the party was hosted, did she go missing before she arrived to look for her purse? Did she go missing at the location where she was looking for that purse? Or did she fail to find it and go missing and something happened to her on her way home? Well, like we said, there was over 100 people at this party, a step that law enforcement could have took early on in this investigation is come that Monday, go to the high school and start questioning a lot of individuals. And I think they would have gathered a lot of information just a couple days after she went missing. Because there were not notes and documents that were kept during the early stages of this investigation, it gets very hard to determine who was spoken to and who and what statements they gave at that time. We have some suspects here to discuss, even though we have a big lack of evidence. The suspects here are both local and one of interest that is from out of town. But one of the things that seems paramount in this case, or at least has remained so throughout the three decades that Denise has been missing, is the local rumors. The local rumors, and the short of it is, These guys or some guys got away with it. They did something to Denise Flum and they got away with it. Now, it's hard to say exactly who these guys are from top to bottom. The list could be longer than what we're going to present here. 
but we have a short list of some very good suspects, at least circumstantial suspects. One we talked about in episode one, his name is Sean McClung. Sean McClung is Denise Flum's previous boyfriend. They broke up in early March. Denise goes missing in late March. Another person of interest is Benny Johnson. Benny Johnson graduated a couple years before Denise. And it's my understanding, Captain, stop me if I'm wrong, but really pinpointing the location of that party and who the landowner was or is of that party right. was a little difficult, but everything I reviewed, I keep getting the sense that the property belonged to the Johnson family. So Benny Johnson graduates a couple years before Denise. He's known to all the locals, all the teenagers and everybody in their early twenties at the time, his father, the Johnson family goes way back. They're farmers. They own a lot of properties in the area and they own a lot of properties that surround Connorsville, Indiana. Yeah, so the property would have been owned by Benny's father, Ben Johnson. Another person of interest is Benny Johnson's cousin, who it appears that they were rather close and were regularly together. Yeah, I don't think locals view him as a suspect on his own, but believe that Randy was involved because of Benny. So his name is Randy Cates, and again, he is Benny's cousin. Then our third suspect is a man named Larry Hall. Now, longtime listeners of this show may recognize that name, and people that watch the Apple TV show Blackbird will most certainly know that name. Larry Hall is a suspected serial killer from Wabash, Indiana, who trolled around the Midwest in the Civil War reenactments. He is accused, again, a suspected serial killer never have has been convicted of murdering anyone, but he is serving life in prison based on kidnapping charges. Yes. And they've had law enforcement agents that have studied Larry's movements and studied the cases that they believe that Larry possibly could be connected to. And the numbers reach up into the fifties, which would make him one of the most prolific serial killers and captain you said something to me that's very interesting when we took our little break here everything i say is interesting well this one went to the top of the list for okay. today anyway okay good that this i cannot think of another case you said to, you said to me that here we have this case where we have three suspects now keep in mind it could also be somebody we have we don't know that, that's not named that we did not name but here we have three suspects. There's not evidence to suggest one is a better suspect than the others. And we all three of them at some point and in or some form has confessed to killing Denise Flum. Three really good suspects that you could make an argument. Somebody could bring an argument to the table and I go, well, that's a good argument. But three good suspects all have confessed in some form or fashion. Two of them have confessed to law enforcement, and then we have confessions from Benny Johnson and or Randy Cates to people that are outside of law enforcement. These would be people that know these two individuals, and they are often referred to as drunken confessions. So again, we have Sean McClung, the ex-boyfriend. He confesses to law enforcement. We then have Benny Johnson that has the drunken confessions. His cousin, Randy, has drunken confessions. Not that he's the murderer, but that he had some involvement. And then we have a confession by Mr. Hall, a suspected serial killer. Let's start with Sean McClung, the former boyfriend. Now, I shared a similar opinion with Ted McQuinley that maybe he's easy to move on from. Again, you want to check his alibis and confirm his alibis before you move on from him. But there's a lot to suggest that it may have been a mutual breakup, that Sean is out living his best life separately from his ex-girlfriend, Denise. But it's not. it doesn't appear until years later that people become more suspicious of Sean. And probably rightfully so. 
So people were concerned that he wasn't looked at very good in the early stages of the investigation. And then he moves away to Arizona. I was trying to get an exact date or at least a week, narrow it down to a week of when he moved, because depending on what reports you review, it says later that year he moved to Arizona. Well, if later that year means she goes missing in March and he didn't move till November, that makes some sense. But if it was within a a couple days or a week of her going missing, that would be very suspicious to me, considering that he's a senior in high school at that time. And he still has his pending graduation coming up later that year. My guess here as captain is that he went and moved to Arizona after graduating high school that year. The reason why this becomes important, one, obviously it looks like he might be running and hiding from something that he did back in Connorsville, Indiana. But two, while he is in Arizona, well, he's not a saint. He breaks the law. And in fact, he ends up getting charged with what is reported as racking up some domestic violence arrests. Yeah. So what law enforcement is not obviously privy to is how these individuals will turn out. So when you have new detectives looking at this case 30 some years later, you go, well, Sean moved away. So that's suspicious. That's a red flag. And he is abusive towards women. So that's a red flag. So then we got to go back and say, okay, well, he had this alibi. And when new detectives look at this case, they're not able to confirm that alibi. And then on top of that, Sean is saying, well, look, we were friends and it was a mutual breakup. But then when you find out, well, Denise wasn't faithful. So I don't know how, how much that seems like a mutual breakup. And there'd be some reason that, Sean would be upset with her, and rightfully so. I mean, they had a relationship and she was unfaithful, but you could see why he would be upset with her. So what he was telling law enforcement is, oh, we were friends and and everything was fine. That's not the correct story. And then on top of that, you got another red flag because she's sending letters at the time saying, hey, I I made a mistake and I'm, I'm fearful. We know this guy is abusive towards women. So it's very possible in this three-year relationship he had with Denise that possibly was, he was possibly abusive towards her as well. I'll say some things in defense of Sean McClung here before we get into some other things that might be point more towards his guilt. In his defense, he doesn't stay gone from Connorsville, Indiana forever. He eventually moves back. And in fact, I found some reports to indicate that he may have bounced between the two locations more than what's generally reported. A lot of the reports make it sound like he went out to Arizona, stayed gone for a couple decades and then came back. The one report I found indicates that he had residents from time to time in Indiana and from time to time in Arizona. So he seems to have bounced back and forth a little more frequently So if he was running from something, and I'm not saying that he wasn't, but if he was running and attempting to hide from something, he didn't stay gone forever. He kept coming back to Connorsville. Yeah, and also in Sean's defense, he keeps coming back to Connorsville, and there's really no local rumors that Sean confessed to anybody. And the other thing, too, while there might be local suspicion, like the captain said, he doesn't seem to have confessed to anybody. He also doesn't return to Connorsville because they've named other suspects or they've had other persons of interest publicly or are hot on a lead of somebody, right? Like the, if he left Connorsville with any stank on him, then there's nothing to have removed that before he decides to return. Now, something that goes against Sean McClung, however, not something that you could use in the court of law. When questioned by police once he's back in Connorsville, Indiana, he does fail, according to their report, that he does fail a voice stress test. Again, this is years later. Yeah, they bring him in for questioning in 2018. Now, again, in his defense, he's been cooperative with law enforcement. Correct, and he fails this stress test. And again, according to, to the report, 
the things that really stand out or the things that they want us to know that stand out to them is they believe the questions, the important questions that he failed on were, do you know what happened to Denise Flum? Do, did you kill Denise Flum? That's where they're saying that their test indicates to them their interpretation of the results of that test is that he was not truthful on those answers. Yeah, I don't know how these tests actually operate or what the test indicates. In the documentary, it makes it seem like uh, a wavering in their voice. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people could have a wavering in their voice if you're asking somebody point directly, did you murder your ex-girlfriend? One thing that I thought was rather off-putting and this was something that the documentary did a really good job of is when the documentarians would go out to interview somebody or attempt to interview them for the first time, they're walking up to them and it's a surprise to the person that they're going to interview. Right. And they did a great job of having the camera person hang back, hang back a little bit. So, this person may not know that we're going to be recording, that we will at least get to hear their answers when they are first engaged by the documentarians. Now, Sean McClung answers some of their questions. He seems to be, he's weird because he seems standoffish in the beginning, and then he seems eager to try to tell them some of the story or at least the portion of the story that he knows, which according to his words is he doesn't know what happened to Denise. He doesn't really know what was going on with her leading up to her disappearance. And I believe he even says that when she first turned up missing, he thought that maybe she just took off or went off with some friends. He says we weren't hanging out with the same people at the same time. We weren't hanging out with the same people at that time. And the weeks leading up to her disappearance, he didn't really know what she was doing or what she was up to because they had parted ways and really truly did go their own separate ways. One thing though, that I thought was a little weird when he was being standoffish with the documentarians, he said, you know, and this could be simply out of frustration or this could be out of guilt or he's trying to hide something. He says, it's been 32 years. I wish people would just let it die. Now, I've never been questioned or suspected of anything or local rumor or people coming up to me asking me about a missing persons case that they think I may have been involved in. So I don't know what that's like. I cannot say what kind of reaction I would have. Maybe he's just frustrated with the whole situation. Why do you keep talking to me? I had nothing to do with this. Why do people keep coming up and talking to me about this? I had nothing to do with it. Or maybe he's trying to hide something and he's uncomfortable by, by the questioning. Probably a little frustrated that they didn't get the answers 30 years ago because if they would have done their work and done their due diligence 30 years ago, they could have possibly cleared him and then he would never been brought up again. The person that has really kept this case alive is Detective Stacy Reese. Mm -hmm. And you see, look, she's amazing. When you watch the documentary, you're going to go, if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be talking about this case. The, you know what? There would be no movement on this case if it wasn't for the Stacey Reese. Well, Stacey Reese and, and like we said, the, the two documentarians, I'd be honored to work with any of those individuals. They were just amazing, and I, I can't applaud their effort enough. But then what ends up happening here with Sean is Sean gets sick and he is arrested on, I believe, fraud charges. Denise's mother, Judy, writes a letter to Sean and basically says, look, your mom was a good person. Denise loved your mom. Your mom's probably in heaven. You probably want to join her in heaven. So just tell us where our daughter is. We, we believe and law enforcement at this time believes you're it. And they do something that's very surprising. Like we said, he has these fra fraud charges. He then would be charged, obviously, with murder. Mm -hmm. And he is sick. He is dying. And so the family makes a deal. Look, if you can just give us 
the location of where Denise's body is and we can find the body, we're going to let you out of prison. You're going to get off on the fraud charges. We're not even going to charge you with murder. So he makes this deal with police and starts talking to police even before his lawyer gets there. And this is a last ditch Hail Mary effort by Judy Flum and her family to say, look, we we don't at this point, all these years later, we don't really care exactly what happened. We are not so concerned about murder charges against you. We just want to bring our daughter home. We want to know where she is and have some answers as to what happened. And as the captain said, he comes in and he, he, he's in his jail uniform and he's in the room with the sheriff and he's starting to confess. His confession is that she contacts him to have him go with her to retrieve the purse. Yeah. This would make some sense with, with her activities that we know, the, the things that she was doing that day. He says that they stopped off at this bridge. She falls, hits her head. He stomps off in, in aggravation and frustration. And when he returns, she's not moving. His push then caused her death, according to this statement. Right. He then says that he contacted a couple of friends. These names, it's not clear whether he disclosed these names to law enforcement or purposely left those names out of his confession. I believe he told them, and but law enforcement has left that information out of public's eyes. And then he says that the friends were contacted so they could help him with this situation, help him dispose of Denise. There's a lot of problems with his story though, because he's, he's very vague. His story is kind of wonky donkey. I mean, he goes out there with her, but it's not clear on how he got to a, a place or where he went to, to, contact individuals to come help him and so his immunity is based off of two things that one he confesses and says what happened which he was able to give him sheriff looks at him in the eye and says look me in the eye and tell me that you are the killer because there could be the real killer out there still and he says no i i killed her so then the next thing that he has to give law enforcement is where are her remains. And he goes out with them on the first occasion to one of the Johnson family's properties. And the sheriff's department says, look, he, he did seem confused as soon as we arrived there. Now, mind you, 30 some years have passed and the location may look quite different than the last time he was there. He also gives some indication, too, that it may have been dark during some of the periods of the activities that he's confessing to. Again, what's crazy, though, is he is so vague in at least the statements that have been released to the public. But he's also very emotional, right? Like, doesn't his emotion almost it almost sealed it for me until then later we learn he can't lead them to Denise's body. And not only can he not lead them there, but it, he seems very confused, almost like he's like, well, I'm going, yeah, it's around here, but he's almost like looking for law enforcement to point him in the right direction. And they're not able to do that. And they're also kind of instructed not to have a bunch of communication with him because that they don't want to interfere with the information that he's giving. Right. They don't want it to appear like they're recording him when he's out on these, let's call them field trips, looking for Denise. They go to multiple properties on different occasions looking for her. He sounds clueless to me. Like he's like, like you said, hoping that law enforcement will point him in the right direction so he can deliver on his end of the deal. And they don't want it to later look like this was an extended interrogation or interview of this man. They want it to be clear that we were rolling tape. We were just letting him talk. We just needed to hear his thoughts. He is supposed to be directing us to where she is. He's not able to do so on multiple occasions. Now, think about this. He has 
all these reasons to confess and all these reasons to try to find where her remains would be. He's going to get off on fraud charges. He's going to get away with murder. He's going to be set free. Yes, he's towards the end of his life. He's withering away, but he's also going to receive $25,000 that he can pass on to his kids because he confessed. He has all these reasons to confess that benefit him. So I don't look at this guy as like, oh, well, he, he just, you know, had a change of heart and he just wants to give people the answer. He's doing this for so many selfish reasons. And, and then the reason why I don't believe him is because he's not able to give them the information that would set him free. He wants to be set free. He wants to not have these charges against him. He wants this money to give to his family, and he's not able to provide the information. What ends up happening here is a very weird sequence of events. He confesses to the murder. He tells them he can lead them to her body. He fails to do so. He fails to give great details of the murder itself. He therefore does not deliver on his end of the deal. So law enforcement says, we ain't going to give you what we promised you either. And in fact, we're not going to give you immunity. In fact, we're not going to give you the $25,000. In fact, we're not going to let you out of jail on these other charges. What we're going to do instead is charge you with involuntary manslaughter because now we have your confession. We just don't have a whole lot of evidence to back it up. They're hoping that this confession that he made on tape which is completely, uh, you know, he, he's not he's not being physically or verbally pressured at the time of giving this confession. The only pressure on him is to make this deal. And they say, we're going to charge you with involuntary manslaughter. And they go out and arrest him later. Th- this It takes some time between these events to, to take place. Well, he's still in prison on the fraud charges, but. And they arrest him for uh, involuntary manslaughter. Now, before he could be taken to court on these charges, he passes away. As the captain pointed out, Sean McClung was was ill at the time. And I'll read some brief statements from uh, from a very good article on the matter that says on September 26, 2020, Sean McClung, age 56 of Connersville, Indiana, died from complications with an undisclosed illness. On July 9th, 2020, the Fayette County Prosecuting Attorney's Office charged Sean with voluntary manslaughter as a Class B felony after he allegedly confessed to killing Denise Flum more than 30 years ago. McClung's alleged confession has made many headlines, but the full circumstances and motivations surrounding the, quote, confession have not been disclosed. Now, as the captain pointed out, Sean McClung, a dying man, he was in jail on two pending cases unrelated to Denise's disappearance. He was unable to post bail. His attorney comes forward and says, look, my client told me in his dying days, I did not kill Denise. I only said that I did that because I was hoping to not spend my last few days on this earth in jail. And I was hoping to give my children the $25,000 reward that they were offering me. I was hoping to leave something to my kids. And his attorney says he was devastated when they turned around and charged him with it. I happen to believe, and Captain, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but I think Sean may have thought that someone in law enforcement knew more about the case than he did. Yeah, definitely. And what parts he couldn't confess to, they would fill in some of the blanks. And maybe together, using local rumor and what the police knew, maybe they could stumble upon a body. Or maybe they would take that portion off of the table if they just got him to confess. Right. In some jurisdictions, in front of some officers, it's good enough to just close out the case, not actually solve it. So where we were really coming down hard on him yesterday for the lack of effort in this investigation. We should point out that they had the easy way out here and they didn't take it. Now you could argue, well, they were going to charge him with that voluntary manslaughter charge. So maybe, maybe his death is what simply removed that 
from the equation. Well, there's still people in law enforcement that believe Sean is responsible for the disappearance and murder of Denise. But there's two things that are really important in this case. Who did it and how do we find her remains? And Sean wasn't able to provide those two important pieces of information. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Again, what a <laughs> this case really blew my mind. Normally, when it's a 30 some year old case, I go, Well, what can we learn from this? Are we going to have any movement on this case? But we have three really good suspects with three confessions. Let's get into suspect number two. Yeah, this is Benny Johnson, and we've spoke about him a little bit before. He graduated a couple years before De Denise, and it's our belief that it was one of the Johnson's properties that was hosting the party the night before. Benny Johnson has been, it's been rumored and it's been stated on camera and it's stated in written reports that he has admitted to multiple people, not law enforcement, but to multiple persons that he killed Denise Flum. Now, the problem with these statements is that he's given multiple different stories as to all aspects of the crime, how she died, how he disposed of her body, though how she died has changed in different stories where the body is or how he disposed of the body has, has changed in different stories what led up to the murder has changed in different stories. He's a guy that it's really difficult to pin down what his actual statements would be. And part of that is he lawyers up. Once the heat gets turned on Benny Johnson, he gets an attorney. Now, I'm not in law enforcement, so I'm not going to pretend to know what the best strategy is at this time, given the state of the case and him as a potential suspect. But it looks like as soon as he lawyers up that, that the sheriff's department takes on a very hands-off approach with this individual. Yeah, they don't call him in. with the, And this is, again, a huge, giant pile of horse shit. You have this individual. He, he is a piece of shit individual. He has some issues. His family owns that property and properties around where her car was found. And you don't bring him into questioning. Now, his lawyer, when they talk to the lawyer, he the lawyer says, well, yeah, you can bring my client in and we probably won't answer any questions, but we'll make a statement. Well, you don't know what that statement's going to be. So you call him in and you record that statement. And they never did that. And that's, again, just it's just lazy horse shit investigation. So on March 27th, that's the day of the bonfire, right? So... There is a, a, a party that night, bonfire party, but there's also a party that Benny has with a bunch of his friends at his mother's cabin. So it's very unclear on how big this party was, but the following day, they're going to have a bigger party. And because they're at this cabin, they need to clean it up a little bit. And they, when they go to clean up this party... His girlfriend sees blood on a sheet. Discover some blood, yes, in the cabin. A lot of blood, actually. And her, their reasoning for this blood is that somebody was having sex and it was their first time and so they bled. But she thought initially, well, this seems like a lot more blood than the reason they're giving. Keep in mind, too, at this time, the, the local thought, the general consensus if you will was that denise was missing voluntarily that she may return there was still a lot of people that believed in the first day or two that she had just gone off with someone or was out partying or or doing stuff that that of course she was not that type according to her parents but that was the local belief 
by a lot of people. So while this may cause some red flags, it doesn't seem to send them all the way up the flagpole. But I believe the girlfriend says that she did report this incident to somebody at law enforcement. Yeah, after a little bit of time went by Mm -hmm. and it started becoming more clear that Denise didn't just walk away from her life, that there was probably some foul play. She did contact law enforcement. But again, law enforcement just didn't follow up on certain things. They could have went out to the property. They could have got maybe a search warrant. They could have got a search warrant for the property of the party. They just didn't do things that you should do. Well, and the Johnsons have a lot of land, and they have different properties, multiple properties, and a lot of these properties are large. You know, they have several acres, uh, if not dozens of acres. Right. And one thing that's troubling here, too, regarding the ex-girlfriend for Benny Johnson is she says that about two months after Denise went missing, Benny's telling her that, hey, after school, I've got something to show you. So after school, she goes and meets up with Benny. He wants to take her out into the woods on one of their properties, one of the Johnson properties. And the girlfriend says at some point she backs out. She got nervous. She didn't feel comfortable going into the woods. She's, uh, she says even to this day, she's a little unclear why she didn't feel comfortable. And she, she's asked direct questions. Was it because you didn't trust Benny? Was it because you were afraid of Benny? And she says, you know, I, I've thought about this a long time. It might simply just be I was afraid of what he was going to show me. Yeah. So here we go. So Benny, the big red flag to me is that the Johnson family, his family, owns this property, owns where her remains could be at, owns this cabin that we find blood in. His girlfriend, Benny's girlfriend at the time, starts suspecting him. He takes her out to this pond She never sees what he's trying to show her. But then, again, all the local rumors that Benny confesses. I think the thing that plays in his favor is, like you said, his confessions seem to contradict themselves or the details don't line up. But then on top of that, they're actually able to question his cousin, which was at the party the night before and and then the night afterwards. And he says... Well, and then there's local rumors that Randy has confessed to involvement. And one of the statements is that Denise went out to get her purse and Benny and Randy um, were out there. So they take her back to a place that they were drinking and they were partying. Now, this could have been the cabin. I'm not for sure. Mm -hmm. Once Denise sees these drugs, she starts freaking out. And somebody, it's not clear based off of this local person this local person came forward and said this is the confession that randy gave him right says somebody punched her and that's where it all started okay now we punched her and now this situation has got out of hand so they end up beating her basically to death and then feeding her to the pigs and that there was screams and she was screaming And basically that Randy is haunted by these screams. Randy says on camera in the documentary that he never claimed to have any involvement and doesn't recall ever making those types of statements to anyone. Again, the people that are saying this are saying that he was heavily intoxicated when he's made these statements. These are referred to as drunken confessions. And he even states that he was in Michigan at the time. Again, right. it's all these years later, it's hard to verify these things. But look, what but what we do know, and I, I hate to cut you off, but this just pisses me off so bad. What we do know is that these scumbags, these rumors, it's not like these are rumors that happened 20 years later. This, this is stuff that pe- there's rumors happening and people talking about Benny and possibly his cousin early on in the investigation. And I wonder if originally if McQuinley was looking so hard at Benny and his cousin Randy Cates that he just failed to see the obvious uh, of a a potential person of interest in Sean McClung. But if you're not a piece of shit detective, then 
and you'd take notes and you did your due diligence, you'd you would know and have confirmed or denied the alibi for Sean, and then you would have been able to confirm or deny the alibi for Randy. And a couple statements that I keep going back to here is one from the family, they they say the pain never goes away. They're absolutely right one hundred percent, and I hope at some point they can locate Denise so they can have some answers, some form of healing can start for them. The pain never goes away. But what did Sean McClung say when he was uncomfortable and the questions were brought to him 30 some years later? He says, it's been 32 years. I wish people would just let it die. What's weird is in some, in some way that's not so obvious to us because it's not reported and not, not been public information in Sean McClung's confession that he gave to law enforcement, he must have implicated Benny Johnson in some form or fashion because that's where they go looking for Denise's body. And we can't say 100% that he did implicate Benny Johnson. But one thing that I found weird was when the documentarians go to interview Benny Johnson, he says something similar. He says, it's been all these years. I just wish people would forget about it. I wish people would just let it go. Yeah. And what a, what a weird thing to have similar statements. Now, he lawyers up, and it does not seem that police are going to jump the hurdle of that lawyer, of that attorney, of that representation, and ask bring Benny in and ask him the hard facts. Well, no, and look... <laughs> Or ask him the hard questions. The creators of the Vice documentary, and I would state their names, but they're difficult names to say, and Detective Stacy Reese, they're the only ones that have ever really talked to Benny. Mm-hmm. To this day, law enforcement hasn't brought them in. And you know this is way in on their family because the family has been asked multiple times to give us permission, give law enforcement permission to do searches, bring in cadaver dogs. And they've been denied over and over and over. So, okay, so on one hand, law enforcement's not questioning Benny, but on the other, on the other hand, they are asking to search properties and they're being denied. Well, actually, I should take that back. I don't know how much law enforcement is actually pushing for these searches, but the family, the Plum family has been... Plum. The Flum, the Flum <laughs> family has been pushing for these searches. So, and, and here was where it gets uh, interesting as well. Because mm-hmm. we talk about those screams. So you have that one confession where they feed her to the pigs and these screams. Well, we do have a witness from 30 years ago, Vivian May. So Vivian tells her kids when they come home, she seems rattled. That she heard some screams. Three or four screams. Three or four screams. Loud, guttural, very uh, uh, horrific, haunting. Yeah, to the point where she screams. She feels, to the point where they know that she feels uncomfortable even just talking about what Mm -hmm. she heard. So they go out and look at this property Ask their mom, where did the screams come from? She points and she goes, look, I I know because these were guttural, horrific screams. Points to this plot of land. And who is the land owned by? Benny Johnson. Ben Johnson Sr. It's it's Johnson family property. Yeah, the property was owned by Ben Johnson. Benny's dad. And on this property, there was a pond. So they call law enforcement, but guess what? Law enforcement doesn't follow up. Just like with the freaking alibis. Just like with the questioning. I, I'm I, Look, I'm still pissed off, and I understand that you have suspects in this case. But again, why didn't you talk to more people that possibly were at this party? Why didn't you go to the high school and start rounding people up and just getting statements? At least we'd have a lot of information to go off of, but you don't even follow up on this Vivian May's story. Now, again, 
the screams were coming from Ben Johnson's property. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then, for whatever reason, one of these ponds were later filled in, which I find to be pretty suspicious. Mm -hmm. And this, this, look, and I know this Ben Johnson is dead, but this guy is a a real son of a bitch because you have an 18-year-old woman that disappeared is most likely was murdered and their remains were most likely disposed of on your property. And it's possible that your son is involved and he has stood in the way of law enforcement or the family to bring in law enforcement to search any of his properties. And he's passed away now, but he kept on saying, well, yeah, I... I was fine with them searching, but we couldn't get together on the details. And I understand that maybe you don't want them coming in and just digging up your property. But grass is going to grow back. I It just, it just baffles me. To me, with all these local rumors and people saying that your son has confessed to them, it's almost like he's protecting his son. Maybe he is afraid of what they'd find. And they were able to talk to Benny's mom. And she says he has issues. And he never does the right thing. Right. So, I mean, it's just, well, but it's like your husband's not doing the right thing either. Let them search the damn property. Because if you search the property and you find nothing, fine. Well, and as far as Benny's confessions or drunken confessions go, that gets a little difficult, too, to to discern just how incriminating that actually is, given that he's given different statements, different stories at different times. But then also the general consensus among amount around town is that Benny don't just have one screw loose. He got a whole bunch of screws loose. Yeah. And so it's hard to believe in anything that he says. And then you want to talk about hard to believe in anything that someone says. You have to talk about Larry Hall, Larry Dwayne Hall as we pointed out earlier, is a suspected serial killer. He's a giant shit stain is what he is. And he's suspected of kidnapping, raping, and killing girls and women in multiple Midwestern states. Thankfully, he is currently locked up in North Carolina, and he does not seem like he's ever going to get out. Uh, He's locked up on federal charges because they found a murdered victim, that they could prove that he kidnapped her and transported her across state lines, right? therefore making it a federal crime. However, they were reserved to charging him with kidnapping because they simply didn't have the evidence they believed at the time to get the murder conviction. They've made great efforts to make sure that Larry Hall never gets out because if you were to believe Larry Hall, or at least... Larry Hall's a man that changes his story frequently. If you are to believe some of his stories, then he may have killed, he may have abducted and killed 30, 40 women and girls. And the reason why he falls into suspicion here is one, he was active at this time, kidnapping females. He lived in Wabash, Indiana. So he's about two and a half hours from Connorsville, Indiana. And some say, well, that's, that's a little far. That might be a bit of a stretch, but a lot of the crimes he's suspected of happened in other States. In fact, the crime that he's convicted of the kidnapping charge that he's convicted of happened over two and a half hours driving distance from where he lives. So the distance alone does not put it out of the realm of possibility that he could be the perpetrator of this. And then furthermore, and I was trying to, to me, this was very important to nail down a date on when this confession came. The confession we have that impl- where he implicates himself as a potential good suspect in Denise Flum's case comes from a list that he created. And the best I could do, Captain, was to determine that he created this list in either 2010 or 2011. And on this list, he lists 39 girls and women. He does not say that he murdered them. 
He says that these are girls or women that he abducted. Well, on that list, he the list is pretty simple. He puts a date, which is simply a year. He doesn't give exact dates, just a year. Right. He gives a name if he can prov- provide a name. Sometimes he just says girl or uh, will give a different title. And then he provides a general location. Well, his list starts with a girl or a person named Debbie in 1981. If we go down the list, one, two, three, four names from Debbie's name, he has listed 1986 Denise Connorsville, Indiana. Well, that certainly matches up with our Denise Flum case. Yeah, and the, the problem with law enforcement with Larry Hall is – is he a serial killer or is he a serial confessor? Or a wannabe. He's been called a wannabe by yeah. several investigators. And look, if you get the time to check out Blackbird on Apple TV, it's a very fascinating story. And I'll just break it down as quick as I can. He's arrested. We don't know if he's a serial killer or a serial confessor. So there was this famous cop that his son was arrested for, I believe, selling drugs. James Keen is the son's name. So they're like, well, look, this this is a son of uh, law enforcement, a really respectable officer. We're going to approach the officer and talk with his son and say, hey, we can put you in a maximum security prison. He's he, He's in a cupcake prison, but we can put you in a maximum security prison you befriend Larry Hall. You get him to confess. You get him to tell you where the bodies are. And if you do so, we'll let you out of prison. Done and done. So he takes the deal. And what happens is he does become friends with Larry Hall. And gets Larry Hall to confess to certain things. And then at some point, Larry Hall has this map that he has red dots on it and those red dots indicate where these crimes took place. And he was carving these little, I believe there were owls and that he would place the owls roughly where the victims were. They, I believe they were Falcons Falcons. Okay. But this is where James Keene screws it up and he's admitted that he screwed this up, but he's in a maximum security prison, probably fearful of his life with every turn also probably fearful that he's going to be found out that he's an informant for the FBI and he sees this map. And instead of taking his time and telling law enforcement and making sure that they can get to this map that Larry Hall has created, he loses it. Yeah. And he basically tells Larry Hall, you are the scum of the earth. You're a giant pile of shit. And it blows his cover and he's unable for a time period to get, I think probably what happened was he tried to get in touch with his well, he FBI got, agent. He got, he gets moved to solitary confinement. So good luck getting your information out when you're locked up in a, in a tiny little room all by yourself. And so at the time, this was an actual, actually a, a medical center for federal prisoners in Springfield, Missouri at the time. And when he sees this map, according to James Keene, he believes that the red dots on the map and the black birds or the falcons or the owls or whatever they were, we don't get clear indication of from Larry Hall exactly what these birds are, but he believes this to be markings of where either where bodies are left by Larry Hall or where he abducted a murder victim or where he murdered a victim. Uh, Larry Hall gets very difficult because there's a lot of people that believe he drove around this big van, this big old van, and there's no doubt he's a murderer. So even though he's never been convicted of murder, keep in mind the kidnapping charge that he is currently incarcerated for is a, an abduction that resulted in death. So he is a murderer. The difficult thing with him is a lot of these, 
people on his list, a good deal of them have never been found, which makes it one incredibly difficult for an investigation. But then on top of that, this guy roamed and roamed and roamed the Midwest to a degree that's unheard of. I've, I mean, we've talked often about a vehicle being a serial killer's tool or weapon. This is crazy. I mean, he's driving around this murder wagon, this murder van, and sometimes he would he would assault and kill, or it's believed, I should say it's believed, that he would assault and kill a victim where he found them and sometimes leave them where he found them. But other times he would abduct them and drive them very far away and torture them in this van that he had. Also known to mutilate the bodies. Now, when you read this, it actually says mutilate the bodies sexually. I'm not. We don't need to go too far down that road. But, I mean, this guy is a horrible individual. And that's my other problem, though, with Ben Johnson and the whole Johnson family is you do have people in law enforcement that go, look, Larry Hall is a a very good suspect for Denise's murder. Let us search your property. Is it possible that he disposed of the body? Not, I mean, think about that. If, If he came across Denise looking for her purse, and somehow captured her or got her to move her car or maybe there was some car problems or whatever. Got her to pull over. Got her to pull over. Maybe he was parked on the side of the road and and she thought maybe he was some guy from the party. Who knows? But it's like he is a good suspect and he might have disposed of the body roughly where he came in contact with her at because it was a very remote rural area. So let them search the property. And the thing is, is if they do find her remains and they can connect the case back to your son, well, then you're taking a a murderer that you clearly have stated. His family has clearly stated that he has mental issues and you're taking a very dangerous person off the streets, whether that's a family member or not, but it's possible that you find her remains and you're able to tie that back to Larry Hall. Larry Hall was arrested in 1994 and he was convicted in 1995 and sentenced to life in prison without parole for the kidnapping of Jessica Roach. Now, under the federal system, if a suspect is convicted in a kidnapping that results in death, there is a mandatory life term with no parole. So he is not getting out. As said, when James Keene was working on getting confessions from Larry Hall, they were spending time at a medical center for federal prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. Hall is currently serving time at the Butler Federal Corrections Complex in the great state of North Carolina. Now, he has on multiple occasions admitted to several murders. And in fact, in 2010 or 2011, he admitted to per this list, the abduction of 39 females. And he was heavily involved in the, in participating in civil war reenact reenactments from 1980 to 1994. According to his list of 39 that he provided to a reporter, he was actively abducting girls and women from 1981 up until he was arrested in 1994. And now some people have called him a wannabe. Some people have said that he's made all of this up. I think we have to, when you take a look at this, you got to give, unfortunately, you got to give Larry Hall a little bit of credibility here. Because before they arrested him in 1994, one thing that that separated him, they had some suspects in some of these cases, these outstanding cases. Larry Hall was a suspect in two of their cases. They start taking a good look at Larry Hall, and then what they realize, they're like, wait a second. We have 11 reports, 11 police reports from girls in five different towns that say they were approached by Larry Hall. 
and multiple occasions these 11 reports they give the they give a description of his van and a description of him his van is pretty unique it's over 10 years old at the time it's two-toned well and some of them are actually able to give his license plate he's unique looking because he's got mutton chops he looks like shit he's on the shorter side he's a little heavier and like the captain said there were multiple reports where what could have been a potential victim was able to give a complete license plate number to law enforcement. And in fact, one time, one of these reports comes from a girl that says he, he was stalking her. She's out on her bike or she's out walking around and he's driving up and keeps approaching her and keeps approaching her and keeps approaching her. And she notifies a police officer who she provides the license plate to. He tracks Larry Hall down, ask him, what are you out here doing? Larry Hall goes, well, I'm out here looking for my friend's address. I'm, I'm trying to locate uh, this person I know. Right. And unfortunately, they don't haul him in right then and there. The law enforcement officer goes back to the station and later looks up that address to learn that it was a fake address that Larry Hall provided there on the spot to get himself out of a jam. So all of these different reports... And then he confesses to killing Jessica Roach, then recants that statement. And then that's when they are able to get a search warrant for his vehicle and for his property. Well, and one of the reasons why I think he's a really good suspect in Denise's case is because when he'd go to do these civil war or revolutionary war reenactments, they might be taking place on a Saturday or Sunday and he would leave early. So he would peruse these towns on that Thursday or the Friday before. And so here we have a girl that goes missing midday Friday. Very likely he was in the area for one of these reenactments. In Larry Hall's initial confession regarding the murder of Jessica Roach, he told investigators that he tied her up but can't remember with what. He says he took off her pants, and then he says that he later raped Jessica, led her to the woods, and then strangled her from behind. He said that he did this because he did not want to see her face as she died. He says that I laid her up against a tree and put a belt around her neck, and then she stopped breathing. Again, remember, he then later recants this confession, which leads to searching for evidence at his in his van and at his property during that confession though captain he also admitted to abducting and killing other girls and gives very vague statements saying all of the girls looked alike i can't remember all of them i picked up several girls in other areas but i can't remember which ones i hurt well larry hall's interesting because like i said he's he's driving around looking for opportunities but he also seemed to have a, a very distinct type. And Denise would fall into that type of victim. Very similar build, very similar look. They found what they are calling a kill kit or abduction kit in his van, which I think we're getting a shortened version of the amount of items that were found. But what is reported is that it was rope, knives, a ski mask, ether, which was also described as a rag soaked in starter fluid, which can be used to incapacitate somebody. Um, and also in the van, they found news stories about kidnappings and serial killers. Now, when they search his home, they find lists and journals that Larry Hall, it's believed that they were made by Larry Hall. And some of the notes were, seen joggers and bikers many alone so it's like he's driving around and taking notes on the different locations that he is he's in seen joggers and bikers many of them alone he goes on in, in the notes to say check colleges check parks seen some prospects then he has a list of items to buy at the hardware store with detailed instructions and the list says, buy two more plastic tarps, cover all floor and sides of van, 
No body contact. Buy condoms. Buy two more leather belts. Find one now. I don't know if he means find one belt now or find a victim now. And investigators also found newspaper clippings about Jessica Roach, who he was later convicted of kidnapping. They also found pornographic photos that they believe were altered by Larry Hall. One investigator saying, quote, he had drawn what looked like a rope or belt around the neck of one of the people. And on the left side of one of the pictures, the left side of the mouth, he had drawn blood. And here's where I have to, unfortunately, give a little bit of credibility to Larry Hall's confessions, or at the very least, list that he provided to that reporter in 2010, 2011. Because on that list, we have Denise's name, 1986 Connorsville, Indiana. Her name is wedged between two other, what he's listing as abduction victims, for the same year, 1986. Mylia is listed as Summerfield, Illinois, 1986, listed just above Denise's name. Just below Denise's name, we have Kim, 1986, and this is from Champaign, Illinois. The thing that's interesting to me here, Captain, is Mylia Chavez was from California. Her body was found in Summerfield, Illinois. And I went through and I cross-referenced a lot of these names listed with the year and the location that he provided on the list. They all check out. There's all a victim with that name from that location who went missing the year that he provides. So that's a little weird. Now, it's also not completely out of the realm of possibility that he's just reading about serial killers. He's clipping all these news stories about abductions, and therefore he's been able to memorize them or put them to memory. And now he's simply interacting with this reporter and getting some kind of satisfaction from providing this reporter with all these false leads or this false confession to all these 39 different abductions. But the one that I want to hone in on is this Mylia Chavez of California. What's so interesting to me is that, yes, he provides this name on his list in 2010 or 2011. She was abducted and went missing in 1986. The remains that were recovered were not identified until 2007. And she was from another state, a state far away, California. She was found in Somerville, Illinois. I don't know that he would know that via newspaper or somebody else telling him. You know, you see what I mean? There's there's enough mystery there, and he gets enough right with such little to go on that that seems to me that there could be a lot of truth, at least to this one particular victim that he has listed. And it's a victim that he's got listed right next to Denise's name. It's it's very difficult to sit here and say which ones we think he committed. But I think that there's probably some truth along the way to this 39. I don't know that I believe all of them, but they're just not able to connect him to this. I also wonder with some of these cases and some of the jurisdictions how how much effort or time or resources they want to spend on it, knowing that he's not getting out of prison. But the other problem though, too, is with these kill kits and possibly these tools or weapons used in the murders. Well, that's great. And maybe you could do some kind of DNA tests as far as like gene genealogy. But a lot of these victims, their remains were never recovered. Correct. Most of these victims were never recovered. We do have, several investigators that are on record saying that if there were to be a DNA match to Larry Hall in some of their cases, he won't be prosecuted because he simply can't be released from prison that he's locked up in federal prison. But here's the thing. Here's where I say, wake up a little bit because it's all set up that he'll never be released in December of 2021. Larry Hall and attorneys filed motions for what's called a compassionate release. 
He was asking for the courts to release him from prison, stating that he is overweight, that he is up there in years, he has high blood pressure, and therefore he is more susceptible to dying from getting COVID-19 and that they should take that into consideration and then release him from prison as a compassionate release. Thankfully, he was denied this compassionate release. Now, one thing that, that I want to talk about, too, is as far as Civil War reenactments go, and the captain hit on something very, very important when you talk about Larry Hall. This guy drove a lot. This guy would often leave early for these reenactments, and he would often come back late. Well, I couldn't find anything in the greater Connersville, Indiana area for the day or two in question regarding Denise Flum's disappearance. But there was a Civil War reenactment in Henning, Tennessee, which was held at Fort Pillow State Historic Area, March 22nd and March 23rd, 1986. It would not be impossible for Larry Hall to travel down from Wabash, from Wabash, Indiana, down to Henning, Tennessee, and stop off on in Connorsville along the way or on the on the way back. The other thing too was just the previous year in 1985 Sunday, October 13th in Roberts Park, there was a Civil War reenactment in Connorsville, Indiana. So there's a chance he had been to the area the year before, just six months before Denise was abducted. So there are some things that do certainly tie him to this case and to a lot of other cases. Well, like I said, we have three good suspects, so I think you could make an argument for either one. And then we have confessions with all these suspects. But that's what pisses me off. We have three good suspects. We have confessions. And I believe if law enforcement would have done the work that they needed to do initially, we would have answers in this case and possibly would know where Denise's remains were. And the family would have some closure and the community would have some closure. Connorsville has been haunted by Denise's case. And I, I think it will be continue to be haunted until they get answers. In 2007, the Indiana State Police were able to collect DNA, Denise Flum's DNA. So she has been listed now in national databases of missing persons. So if or when her remains are recovered, they can be identified as that of Denise Flum. If anybody has any information regarding the death or disappearance of Denise Flum, please contact the Fayette County, Indiana Sheriff's Department. Or if anyone has any information regarding Larry Dwayne Hall, please contact the FBI. thank you all for joining us here in the garage make sure you are subscribed to the podcast colonel do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful beautiful listeners yes we do captain this week we are recommending a classic it's called love me to death by the great steve jackson this is the chilling true story of william wild bill cody neal the vicious denver lady killer this was originally released in 2011 by New York Times bestselling author Steve Jackson, and he's also a an award-winning journalist as well. This was re-released at the end of last year because, again, it is a true crime classic. So check out Love Me to Death by the great Steve Jackson. You can find that recommendation and many more on our recommended page at our website, truecrimegarage.com. And if you're not following us on YouTube, check us out at True Crime Garage on YouTube. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.